This is now. We live in an amazing time. The pixels on your screen are transformed from zeros and ones. The travel is light in fiber optic cables. Traveling before coming back to you. We live in an amazing time, which is why I want to talk about the future internet or what people are keywording as the metaverse. The idea that we can bring communities together in a spatial internet isn't new. Early massively multiplayer online games called multi-user dungeons or MUDs were created in the 70s, a time that predated the internet. And later in the 90s, when the internet was still on dial-up, attempts to create metaverse-like platforms began with the likes of Worlds Chat or Alpha World. Working to set web standards, enter Active Worlds, a young company that proposes to set standards enabling you to build web objects and manipulate them. The Active World technology will allow the 3D Global Mall to coexist with a web page that's in 2D and bring it into a virtual space. And around the same time, virtual reality markup language, or VRML, was one of the first attempts at an open source programming standard for the metaverse. It is the 3D equivalent to HTML. And although it didn't take off, many little projects sprouted out of it. In 1998, using VRML, the first online 3D virtual performance took place. It was a live stream performance of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Which is crazy to think about. A live stream performance on dial-up? But just recently in 2020, during the start of the pandemic, a pre-animated Travis Scott concert in Fortnite attracted over 30 million players with over 12 million concurrent players at its first show. In the mid-2000s, other open source projects like Open Croquet caused a stir because they look like promising frameworks for a customizable multi-user 3D internet. But despite the cool features like easy world traversal, they didn't catch on. Second Life, which I'm sure we've all heard of, also grew in popularity in the 2000s. But after its peak in 2007, it didn't garner the same amount of interest, something that's changing now. So despite the hype train in the early 2000s and the recent renewed hype Much with Facebook life. now as Meta, NVIDIA's Omniverse, Microsoft's Mesh and HoloLens, Magic Leap's headset, increasing success of Fortnite, Roblox, Qualcomm chips in VR headsets, Unreal glasses, Snap spectacles, Ray-Ban lenses, and everything in between, we're still evolving into this future internet, which is why we should talk about privacy agency, and ethical design. Privacy, at least in the United States, is based on the Privacy Act of 1974. It was passed during the climax of the Watergate shall scandal. Resign the presidency effective at and while it tomorrow. does offer protections to citizens from the government, it doesn't necessarily do it from private companies. If we flash forward to now, almost half a century later, no federal laws exist to fully protect the privacy of consumers. Laws exist in healthcare, child protection, and governmental oversight, but not for the everyday consumer. While Europe has come up with the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR, and while it's the closest thing to a modern privacy regulation that extends to the age of the internet, it's also one of the first, so it's not perfect. And yes, there are some states that have passed privacy laws, notably California with its California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA, which came into effect in 2020. But it's also new, and some might argue narrow in scope than the GDPR. In general, violations of privacy are governed by the FTC, or the Federal Trade Commission. As of 2020, it was composed of around 1,000 to 2,000 employees, of which only around 50 handle privacy information full-time for a population of over 300 million people. That means that with a $300 million annual budget, they spend about a fraction of a dollar per person on protecting their privacy. 
And as AR and VR headsets become less clunky and evolve into smaller form factors, the bulk of processing will get offloaded to a computer nearby or to servers online. This shift will require us to pay close attention to how data is handled as it travels back and forth from the headset to the cloud. A Stanford study recently showed how it's easy to identify people in VR by how they tilt their head during movie watching with only five minutes of data. This means that if you were to jump from one experience to another in the future internet, you'd be identifiable across these experiences just by the way you stand. But privacy isn't the only issue that the future internet raises. As we begin to lose our privacy, we begin to peel away at our agency. Peeling away at our agency, and agency which describes our ability to make our own decisions free from interference, is a fundamental feature of what makes us human. While the personalization of content from analyzing our habits on the web makes YouTube, Instagram, TikTok all the more pleasurable, we know that it can imprison us in the bubble, reducing the number of options available and effectively degrading our agency. If it wasn't for the prediction that YouTube made of your preferences, you wouldn't have clicked on this video, and I'm grateful for that. But the reality is, is that we are susceptible to nudges from simple psychological hacks and with a future internet that will track our eyes, our gestures, and our preferences beyond what the 2D internet has been able to do, our attention and decisions might be influenced by something even more subtle. But despite these issues, the world will continue turning and technology will continue to advance and set new milestones. Gradually, the metaverse or the future internet will become a part of our lives. When that happens, I don't know. But as I've said before, the idea isn't new. It's been in the making for decades. And the technology that will power it, mainly interoperability, will continue to advance because outside of the metaverse, it has immediate utility in almost every major sector imaginable. Only because Facebooks or Meta stocks took a hit. Well, down 22%. Uh, this that. is the bottom. They've stopped. And fear mongering continues to ensue about a dystopian future doesn't mean that the future internet is dead. The real challenge, in addition to the technical constraints of technology and the potential worsening of shortages in rare earth elements and chips, is going to be in how companies or decentralized communities build trust into the products that mediate access into the future internet. And this will mainly occur through ethical design. Ethical design is necessary because in the more spatial internet, the information third parties will have to our body and behavior levels up. Physiological and neural information might become a norm in the somewhat distant future of apps. So it's important to start thinking about what rights individuals have for their rich neural and behavioral data. Right now, the legal standing on neural rights, like the right to mental privacy or the right to agency, are a little bit fuzzy because as a legal concept, they don't really exist. And for them to come into existence, they probably have to piggyback off of existing rights. For example, the right to agency could come from the implied freedom of thought from the First Amendment. Regardless of how they come into existence, companies can begin to imbue ethical design into their core values. Privacy settings could stay as user-chosen defaults that at the hardware level provide yes or no access to requested eye gaze or any other form of biometric user data. Privacy permissions could adapt to contexts and privacy policies and terms of services could be more transparent and easier to understand. Badges or icons describing consumer producer contracts akin to how Creative Commons licenses can be made into human readable formats could be designed. Okay, so here's a thought. If biometric data is so valuable, then maybe it should be considered protected medical data, right? Well, this has problems too. For example, 
23andMe collects your DNA and then gives you an ancestry breakdown and personalized health insights, including your propensity to some diseases. How do we label biometric data legally? Is it private property? Is it medical information? Is it considered testimony? Although the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, protects people from being discriminated by employers or health insurance on the basis of their genetics, it doesn't protect you from discrimination from life insurance. Because the Fifth Amendment protects you from self-incrimination, courts are still debating whether the passcode which exists in your head is considered testimony and thus protected by the Fifth Amendment. There's a nuance here that if your phone is unlockable via face recognition or fingerprint ID, then you're not protected by the Fifth Amendment because face recognition or fingerprint ID, which are physical attributes, are not considered testimony because they don't exist in your head. The point being here is that there are subtleties to legal language that have powerful implications for the future. The reality is, is that the future internet will be more spatial and more embodied than what it is now, but it's not gonna be the dystopian future depicted in Ready Player One. It's just gonna become part of our lives, just like most things end up being. And hey, I'm not saying the metaverse is the end. Don't innovate, don't use eye tracking. No, no, on the contrary. I'm saying use all of these things through ethical design. We just have to become educated in the information that we might unknowingly disclose when we take services for granted. The future looks so bright and incredibly exciting. With AR and VR, we've already been able to do so much. Anything is possible. In VR, people have made deep, intimate connections to the point of getting married, have made new friends, have gotten therapy for phobias, PTSD, speech impediments, social anxiety, physical rehabilitation, social rehabilitation, and even doctors are getting better at surgeries, which will inevitably lead to saving more and more lives. We live in an amazing time which is why we have to be intentional about how we approach the future. The future internet is probably not gonna be what we imagine right now, but it's gonna be something that we help shape.